So where is R&D in a business? You don't have to have departments with formal names like an R&D department, your engineering department, product design group, in order to uh, generate an R&D task credit. You don't have to have a line item that says R&D. Um, R&D is taking place in many parts of a business. There's many people within a company that are touching R&D. It can start with your, with your sales, your technical sales people, and it works its way to your engineer, your CAD programmers, your tool makers, your quality people. There's a lot of people in a business that are touching the R&D task credit process. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna run you through the types of qualifying costs that you're gonna to wanna to take a look at in order to uh, you know, assess your R&D task credit opportunity. The first cost, and by far the biggest cost, the largest component of just about every company's R&D task credit are the wages of the people within the business that are touching the R&D task credit process. So when, when trying to quantify this, this number, the, pe the, the first people you're gonna look at are obviously the people directly doing the work. Like I said, it might be your CAD programmer, your, your software developer, your tool makers. The people directly doing the work are, are obviously gonna help you qualify for the R&D task credit. But in addition to that, and where you often get a nice little bump with the small businesses, the small to medium sized businesses, is when you take a, a, a look at the people within leadership or ownership or management, where you have those people that in addition to spending some of their time on running the business activities, they also, you know, as you know in a small businesses, you wear a lot of hats and the owners are often also getting involved in the sales process or they're in the back getting involved in the, in the manufacturing process. And in many cases, people in management or ownership pay themselves real well too. And so because it's a wage-based salary, when you, if you get those owners or shareholders that are, are, are spend a lot of time on the R&D activities, that helps give a, a nice little bump to the business's R&D tax credit. And then in addition, sometimes you might have a, some people in a support role within a business whose time you could uh, qualify uh, for the R&D tax credit. This might be someone, if you have like biweekly product development uh, meetings and you have somebody taking some notes around design issues or if you apply for patents and you have somebody who spends time filling out patents, you could qualify some of that time. Now that's, you know, and, and at the end of the day, it's gonna be a small percentage. The majority of time are gonna, is gonna be from the people doing the work as well as the people in management or in ownership. Second bucket of supply cost, or second bucket are supply costs. So to the extent that you're doing modeling, prototyping, testing, and you're using up supplies as you try to figure stuff out, you know, sometimes you may tr be trying to develop a market that doesn't exist yet. You don't have orders. You're just trying to create something uh, for, for, for some market out there, and you've got no orders. That's money out of your pocket. That can be qualified supplies, and sometimes you'll have orders from customers, but you still are trying to figure some stuff out, and those supply, you know, you can have supply costs there as well. So uh, supply costs are the second bucket, and then external labor costs. So to the extent you have to go outside of your business for certain skill sets or expertise that you might not have. So you may have to uh, hire a, a, an engineering firm or a design firm, or you have a product and you want to go to market, but it has to become certified or tested before it can go to market. Um, if anybody does defense work, a lot of times, you know, the threshold uh, is, is higher for approval. And a lot, of, you know, a lot of times you need certain types of certification. Those costs can be considered a contracted research cost. Uh, if you uh, want to apply for a patent and you hire a, a patent attorney, uh, those attorney fees can be considered a contracted research cost. So, what, and then what you need to keep in mind about the external labor costs is that once you identify what all those costs are, you're then limited to 65% uh, when it comes to the R&D cash credit. So if you have $100,000 of external labor costs, what you can throw in the R&D bucket is 65 grand, okay? So those are, the, those are the three buckets of qualified costs that you're gonna be looking at. Again, the biggest driver almost always are the wages. And the other thing I should have said at the beginning, by the way, is the definition of R&D, which we're gonna talk about now for federal purposes, is exactly the same as for the state purposes. So it's not like the, the state credit has a totally different definition of R&D. So when you're quantifying and qualifying all your, your R&D activities, 
and you come up with some dollar amount, you're going to use that same dollar amount f when, when computing the, uh, the North Dakota state credit. So there's this thing called the four-part test, and this is the definition of R&D for tax credit purposes. The activities that you're looking at or the activities that you're doing need to meet all four parts of the test, not one, not two, not three. They need to meet all four. However, those activities don't all need to be done by the same person. They just have to be taking place within a business, okay? And so again, at a high level, keep in mind, oh, I, I went too fast there. I meant to hit the pointer button. We are talking about activities involved with developing a new or improved product or process. It can be in the manufacturing environment. It can be soft products like food and chemicals, hard products like, like agricultural equipment, furniture. It can be software, technology, biotech. I mean, when I, you know, when I think about this building and innovation, and I see all the different businesses within here. It's all, it's all about R&D. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through each of these, each of these uh, tests, and then at the end of the four-part test, I'll, I'll stop and ask if anybody has any questions. So the first test is what's called the permitted purpose test. This simply says that you have to have a goal. Again, at a high level, develop and or improve a product or process. Enhance quality, reliability, functionality, or reduce cost. Those are all, that, that, this is usually a pretty easy goal for most manufacturers to meet because if they're not doing these things, they won't be in business a real long time. So most businesses are, are, you know, have a goal that would qualify. What's important to keep in mind here with, the, with this goal is we are, as, as it says, looking for evolutionary development. We're not looking for anything revolutionary. So it doesn't have to be something brand new to the world, never, never been seen before in order to qualify for the R&D tax credit. What the government is trying to incent, as I said earlier, is for companies to invest back in their business and make incremental improvements. So they want, you know, they want company A to come out with a product, and they want company B, in order to be competitive, to, to come out with another product that's a tad bit better. And then in company C takes it up another notch. And then in order to compete with B and C, company A has to get better and, and develop new capabilities for their business. So it can be a capability that their competitors have, but if it helps their business grow and be more efficient, then business A qualifies for the R&D tax credit, business B qualifies, and business C qualifies. So you, again, it doesn't have to be something that's never been done before, okay? And so the example we use here is the car. The car has been around for over 100 years. You know, the main purpose is still the same, which is to get somebody from one point to another. Um, but obviously what's happened over the last 100 years is the cars have become you know, more fuel efficient, more aerodynamic. They're using different shapes, different metals. You know, the science obviously behind that, you know, everything in the car is different now than it was 100 years ago. But every model year, the car companies come out with some enhancements that are generating them R&D tax credits. Now, unfortunately, they probably haven't had the need for tax credits, but hopefully the, uh, the automakers will be able to uh, carry those forward and, and use those credits in the near future. I just read that Delta Airlines just had a, a, a $500, $600 million profit, so if the airlines can get uh, profitable, then hopefully the automakers can get profitable too and use those tax credits. So again, evolutionary development. Second test says you have to have technological uncertainty. And what this means is, is that now you have, you have a goal, you're trying to accomplish whatever it is, a new product, but you don't know which path you're going to go down in order to reach that goal. You have option A, B, C, D, E, F, G, up to you know, Z, whatever, whatever it is, and it's, but it's not readily known which path you're going to take in order to get there. Okay? Not to be confused with being confident that you will get there. You can have a concept, um, when I, I talked with uh, some of the folks at Brady Marts this morning, you, you know, most, business has, uh, most businesses have salespeople or somebody responsible for sales, and when those salespeople are talking to a, a prospect or a customer, 